Uh, welcome to this session. Um, so my name is uh, Ipsam. I'm an architect in Red Hat. So we will go over how to build high quality OpenShift application. So when we think about high quality in OpenShift, right? What does quality mean? Yeah, quality have a lot of meaning. Um, you know, a lot of time it come with you know um, customer satisfaction, um, assurance, you know, excellent program, right? Uh, reliability, right? And there were different things that come come with it. So let's see how we could apply all these different concepts into our OpenShift application. So when we think about OpenShift, uh, what does OpenShift mean? The characteristic of OpenShift is, is an application adopting the principle of microservices and packaged as containers orchestrated by a platform running on top of cloud infrastructure. So from here, we can focus on looking into application, microservices, container, and platform to see how we could improve the quality. So overall, in general, OpenShift have some sort of ecosystem that when you commit your code into Git, it would trigger a webhook into Jenkins, right? Or Tekton or any CI CD pipeline that will start the build process, start the test, and then it will kick off the deployment to deploy to dev QA and port, right? So this is kind of a high level uh, picture of what OpenShift does. So now we have a basic understanding. So let's think about like what, how do we ensure quality and, and each individual piece. So the first thing is to keep application config file outside of the image. This is important because the container image that include environment specific configuration cannot promote it to production environment, right? They need to be uh, specific into dev, QA, and port. And to achieve a reliable release process, the same image needs to be tested in a lower environment in dev and QA first before it deploy to production. Keeping the environment specific configuration outside of the image allow you to use the same image for deployment in dev, QA, and port. An example is to use config map or secret to store the application configuration. So now uh, another uh, suggestion is to re keep the resource request and the limit at the pod. So a lot of time we have application running out of memory and incurring CPU starvation because of improper configuration, right? You are asking too many re resources that you don't need. Right, so specify a request uh, memory and CPU resource limit to the cluster to make a proper scheduling decision. This is important so that we could ensure the application will have the requested resource when it is available. Um, define the lifeless and readiness probe. Right, so this lifeless readiness probe go come back to the health check. If we have a health check probe that allow us to check the um, uh, the cluster re resiliency of the application is going to improve your application quality right that uh, also allow you to the cluster to restart your application when your liveness probe fail we could avoid traffic to the application when it is not ready right when the application liveness probe is is re re returning of uh, not successful status then just stop all this traffic to this cluster and redirect the traffic to another cluster, right? So that would allow you to do a high availability and improve the quality. Um, all this lifeless readiness probe go tie back to the monitoring and health check of your application in OCP. Protect your application with port disruption budget, right? The application port may need to be evicted from the cluster node. So, so the eviction is needed before the administrator can perform maintenance on the node or before the, before the cluster auto scale can remove the node from the cluster while downscaling, right? So how do, we, how do we do that? We can do this by ensuring the application remain available when the port needs to be evicted. So in order to do that, we must define the uh, port disruption budget object. That needs to be tied to your application. 
um, ensure your application port terminated gracefully when it needs to be terminated, right? The application complete all the in-flight requests and terminate it according to your process and, and, and uh, terminated all the existing connection gracefully. So you don't have any dangling open connection. This is going to help you um, maintain the application uh, without going out of memory and without going into any dangling connection from your when, when it restarted, right? Um, and, and this also help you keep track of when a new newer version of the, of the application is deployed. One thing, only one, one process per container. This is really important to remember. We want to avoid running multiple processes in one single container because there were a high risk, right? You may get into, uh, a, a, you know, a, a racing condition, right? Or, you know, um, a one, one resource, you know, one process modify the resources while the other is trying to use it. You don't want to get into that situation, right? Each process in, in a separate container allow a much better isolation of the process. Avoid issue with you know uh, signal routing, right? We want to avoid uh, avoid well, avoid all these like zombie processes. So make sure that you check how many processes you are running in your container. Implementing uh, application monitoring and alerting is also an important concept. Keep the op application operating well in production to serve the business, right? Um, so some of the tools such as Prometheus or Gavana dashboard would allow you to monitor your application. Configure the application to log uh, to standard output and standard error when there's an exception. Um, so OpenShift collect those logs and send them to a centralized location such as ELK or Splunk. The application logs are uh, in a very important resource when you need to analyze production issue. Alerting based on the content of the application logs enable you to ensure that the application is performing as expected. So, so a lot of time we were checking, you know, reporting, alerting based on specific error messages, based on error code, status code, right? So, so that we can say, hey, you know, if you get, you know, too many uh, external uh, error of HTTP 500 happening, then we know, oh, this is an application code issue, then we need to log, go and dig into the code. We see the NC measures, right? Such as, you know, circuit breaker. If, if, you, if you retry too many times, you definitely need to have a circuit breaker to avoid a DOS attack, right? Time out, retry, rate limit. Um, application performs much better in case of failure. So you, you need to protect your application from getting overloaded, right? So that, that's really the point. So you, you can improve the performance with connection issue and also consider leveraging OpenShift service mesh. Right? Service mesh is important because it help, it, it help you implement all these different measures without the need of the code change in your application. Uh, use trusted base image, base container image. This is important because it will avoid any security issue that you may have, right? Um, the vendor provided image needs to be tested, needs to be hardened, needs to be supported. Uh, community, community image, uh, supported image usually could be used as a trusted resource, right? We don't want to use any unknown uh, origin of images that would pose a security risk. Use the latest version of any base image. Right. The base image contain the latest uh, security fixes or bug fixes. Right. Set up your CI/CD pipeline. Always pull the latest image, so that when there's an image change, you you will um, get a failure and go back and fix your code. Right. With the new change, set up your CI/CD to CD pipeline to rebuild the application using the using the updated base image. The build image and one-time image, you need to separate the build image versus the one-time image because they, they are different, right? Um, so so uh, you can create a separate one-time image with minimum dependency. That would allow you to reduce the attack surface and produce a much smaller one-time image. The idea is to build this image. Um, the build image contain the build dependency that are required for building but not require for running the application. So that's an important, important concept to remember. 
uh, restricted the security context constraint. Modify your container image to allow warning under the restricted SCC. The application are vulnerable, right? When the attacker can take control of the application. So using the SCC, right? You can um, provide the highest level of security that protect the customer from being compromises in case of the application being breached or attack. Always communicate using TLS, right? Using your application component, communicate, sens <clears throat> communicate sensitive data and information should be protected. So um, yeah, use TLS to protect any traffic in between any application components and consider using service mesh as well to offload the TLS management from the application. So now we have some high level idea what um, what to look for at the container layer, right? So let's look at the application layer. On the application layer, um, the first thing I would introduce is the solid principle, S-O-L-I-D. What does it mean? Uh, single responsibility, open close principle, uh, least cost substitution principle, interface aggregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. We will go over example in the following slides and um, help you understand how to uh, do that in your application development. Single responsibility is simple, right? So you don't want to do too many things at the same time. So um, as a result, every class should have only one responsibility. That is basically do one, one single responsibility. If you are doing too much, then you need to refactor that class into smaller classes. Open close principle. So what does it mean? Software entitles to um, and so software entities should be open for extension and closed for modification, right? So so think about using interfaces and abstract classes, right? You should always have a way to extend your object when you need to add additional feature, but you don't want to modify the base class. This cough substitution principle. Right. So what does that mean? So any object in a program should be replaceable with an instance of a sub subtype without changing the correctness of the of that program. Right. So that allow you to take on, you know, um, subtype or a more granular object. Right. When your business requirement change, I can spin off another type, do another subtype that contain the re new business requirement. And then when I feed that object into the main program, my program should not need to change. Right. So that's the idea. Interface aggregation principle. So a lot of time we have a lot of um, uh, uh, different interfaces that we need to deal with, especially legacy code, right? The interface may return you know, tens of hundreds of different data fields or, or any, a lot of these fields in the data model, we don't need it at all, right? So, so when you develop your application, remember to always create your client-specific interface. You could have a client-specific interface on top of a legacy interface, that will only return the data that you need. So the benefit of doing that is to, you know, um, your data model will be a lot smaller, your performance of the code will be a lot faster, and you don't need to deal with any additional uh, uh, information that you don't need. So that would reduce the size of your code and at the end improve quality. Dependency inversion principle. So one should depend upon abstraction, not concretion, right? So, so always, you know, think about if you have a way to use the um, abstraction layer of, of the object, right? If, um, use the abstraction. Do not depend on the concretion. So, so um, that include example in the Java world, we use auto wire for dependency. We use bean connection, right? These are a uh, 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 good example of the uh, dependency inversion. So, how about the principles in the open shift layer? Right. How do we apply similar solid principle to the OpenShift world? Uh, single responsibility principle, yes, definitely we can apply to OpenShift. Right? Uh, each pod should contain uh, multiple container. Each container should be single responsibility. Right? Each container should only do one thing. If, you, if it is doing more than one thing, 
then we need to refactor it and create additional containers. Self-containment principle, right? Each container should not rely on anything else except the Linux kernel that it runs on, right? So that kind of tie to the, um, uh, um, you know, related to the, the uh, uh, open close principle in the Java world, right? So, so you should be self-contained, right? If you are, have container one depends on container two and so on, you are creating additional con um, dependency. Uh, the dependency layer will, will, will cause additional problems. So don't do that. Image immutability principle, right? The container image should be targeted for all environment. Right? So you should be able to use the same image for dev, for QA, for production without changing it. So as we talked about earlier, the way, how do we achieve that is to move the application environment configuration out of the image and move it into a config map or secret. High observability principle, right? So each container should have its own health check. Health check include liveness probe, readiness probe for microservices, right? Um, Sonar queue databases, um, you know, Spring Boot actuator for Java, for example. Um, and at the container layer, we should use Splunk, CloudWatch, right? Uh, application Insight for uh, monitoring and alerting, right? Life cycle uh, conformant principle. Each container should conform to, to signal coming from the platform, right? So the signal will trigger the life cycle of the container, right? Uh, sick term, right? So signal terminate will terminate the container. Sick kill, it will kill the container. Uh, prep, prep stop, P stop and uh, post start, right? So these are P and post event that happen, you know, uh, on, on the stop or start. So these are all should all be respected. As part of as part of the container life cycle, so if you are not following any of these events, then you are not following this principle. Uh, process this possibility principle. A container can be killed at any time. It uh, can be killed at one time, right? So think about this, right? So when when your container crash, it should be able to kill itself. Your application should not be dependent on a specific instance of that container. So how do we do that? So that go bring up the discussion of stateful versus stateless application, right? So for, for application that have stay, right, you just need to store the application stay into databases or persistent volume claim, right? Um, so when your applications restart, you still have a way to retrieve the data, right? It would allow us to do a rapid startup or shutdown of the application. The one-time confinement principle. Each container should be viewed as a one-time dimension, including three vertical, size, memory, and CPU usages. You need to, need to specify this dimension in the configuration, including in auto-scaling, uh, max mean number of instances, warm-up cooldown period of the scaling, right, scaling threshold, and scheduling. All this needs to be considered and identified right, during, the, during the container definition. Um, so now we have a high level understanding of the container, right? Um, so on the Java world, remember, <clears throat> we have different type of design pattern uh, that we could leverage, right, for, for the coding quality, right? So you, you can think about your three different uh, uh, vertical creation, behavior, and structure. Right? Each one of them has a specific design pattern you could follow to improve the Java code. Um, I personally also like TDD a lot because it helped me improve the code quality, right? The benefit of TDD, it has high code coverage, right? I do the uh, unit test first before I go to implement my code, right? All these code are intentional, so only required code will be checked in, right? I understand the business use cases before I go start the development process. It reduces uh, uh, bugs in the production environment and shorten development life cycle, right? All of also for follow the triangle for TDD. Write your test, we change your code and make the test pass, and then do refactor. So when we talk about TDD, a lot of time <clears throat> we would think about the test pyramid. <clears throat> what does testing pyramid do, right? 
at the base of your pyramid, you have to have your unit test. <clears throat> unit test <coughs> should con con contain about 70% of your test. On top of unit test, you have integration test. Integration test would be an, another 20%. And then your UI automation test will be another uh, 15%. Manual testing, it will still exist because it's not possible to automate everything. So it will be at the top of the pyramid. It should be the smallest portion of your test. It should compose only five between five to 10% of your total test. So remember to follow the pyramid. <clears throat> do not do the inverse of the pyramid on the, on the other side, because a lot of organization may go into that direction. And then at the end, they end up, you know, uh, having too many manual tests and it's just wasting their, their time and reason. 